Hello, everybody, and thanks very much for joining us this evening. I'm James, uh, and I organise the Sports Journalism Awards for the SJA. Uh, and we've got what we hope is going to be uh, a really informative webinar for you. Uh, for, for anybody looking to enter this, uh, the Young Sports Photographer of the Year category at the awards this year. Uh, just to give you an idea of what to expect in tonight's webinar and just to do some introductions, we're going to have an update on the industry from Paul Gillam, uh, who's Director of Sports Photography at Getty Images. Uh, myself, I'm going to quickly cover a little bit about the SJA, the awards and why we want you to enter. Uh, Jackie Moore's Press Segment Manager from Canon is going to be interviewing our three previous award winners. We've got Alex Pantlin, who was uh, last year's Young Sports Photographer of the Year. Richard Heathcote, li uh, last year's Sports Photographer of the Year, who's coming live from South Africa uh, tonight. So we've gone truly international. Uh, and we've got Richard Pel Pelham, uh, Sports Photographer of the Year in 2017. Uh, and there's a fair few trophies uh, between those guys. So it's going to be great to hear from them. After the interviews, uh, we're going to do a little bit of a, 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 of a Q&A. So please, uh, please submit your questions uh, via the chat or via the, uh, via the Q&A section and I'll pick them up and we'll, uh, we'll go through those with the guys at the end. Uh, and also we've got some exciting news for you. We've got uh, Richard Pelham uh, has donated one of his award winning books, A Life behind the lens which we're going to give away to one of the participants in tonight's webinar to so say stay to the end and we'll do uh, we'll do the prize draw it's all it's all very glamorous i'm going to pick one of the names out of uh, out of a hat um uh, uh before we start uh, and get into it i just want to say a big thank you to jackie and at canon who's done the vast majority of the organizing behind tonight uh, Canon are a great supporter of the SGA, so uh, a, a big thank you. Uh, but right, that is uh, enough of me. I'll hand you over to Paul, um, who's going to give an update on the industry and what's been uh, uh, a unique and very difficult year, I'm sure. Yeah, thank, thanks, James. Um, as, well, as well as talking about the industry, I'll just give a little bit of background on, on my career in sports photography and how I got to <laughs> to where I am now um, and, and Getty Images uh, position within that. So but first of all, obviously, I'd, you know, I'd like to thank yourself, uh, the SJA and Canon for inviting me this evening. Um, I would much rather we were doing this in a pub somewhere, but uh, unfortunately it's 2020 and sadly hasn't been quite the year that we all expected it to be. Um, the reason that I'm delighted to be here is because many of you that have joined this webinar presented me with one of my favorite days of the past 12 months. Um, I was lucky enough to be a judge for last year's SGA Awards and one of the categories that I enjoyed most was the Young Photographer of the Year Award. Um, the quality of the entry was truly fantastic and highlights the great line of talent that's coming into our industry and I'm hoping that you'll all enter again this year and we get to see your entries. I'll start by giving just a little insight into my career and sorry, sorry if I reminisce a little bit too much but um, the reason I'm doing this is because the um, there is a very exciting career path out there um, and there's no better place to highlight your talent within the S the, than within the SJA Awards. Um, like many of you, uh, I, I, I started my, my journey in sports photography while studying at university. Um, I actually wanted to be a journalist at a young age, but my dad thought that I'd have more luck being a photographer as he thought it was less competitive. Little did he know. Um, so anyway, I, I fell in love with photography uh, and ended up on a degree course in, in Nottingham. Um, I'll be honest with you, most of my lecturers tried to tell me that well, there was no career in sports photography and that I should, I should focus elsewhere, but I can wholeheartedly tell you that they were wrong. Um, there was, there was one, one lecturer who did believe um, and encouraged me to push on. Um, and at the end of my third year, I started photographing my favorite football team, Bristol City, um, and eventually convinced them to employ me as a staff photographer. When I told my lecturer that, um, uh, he was delighted and said they should pay me at least £25,000 a year. I didn't have the heart to tell him that they'd offered me just 11000 But anyway, I accepted the job and didn't look back. Um, within six months of that, I was badgering the leading sports agencies in London and wanted to work for them. Um, and eventually got my, got my opportunity with Action Images, who offered me a job in the dark room to be a junior photographer. 
uh, it was it was a great experience and set me it set me up nicely. But then thirteen months my thirteen months later, I was offered the chance to join Getty as a field editor. Um, something that on paper looked like a step back, but in honestly, you know, I, I thought it gave me the opportunity to take a giant leap forward, um, and it was the best thing I ever did. I learned more being a, an editor um, in twelve months than I had previously doing anything else. Um, Senior photographers in this industry uh, are one of its greatest assets, and and you should all lean on on all of them. Um, look to them for advice. Um, look to them for guidance. They're they're more than happy to pass that on, as as Richard Pelham and Richard Heathcote um, will testify. Um, you know there there is a lot of talent out there, and people want to share share their their journey with you and help you progress to become um, the next generation. Um, so eventually, yeah, yeah, you know, I was a star photographer at Getty, and then and then found myself in a position where I was uh, hanging up the cameras to sit behind the desk, and now I lead the, our sport operation across Europe, um, and I have the great honour of leading leading that operation and shaping its future, which is where you guys are so important because I'm I'm looking for the next generation. Um, we currently run a really successful mentoring scheme in the UK with senior photographers, um, helping young photographers, giving them feedback and advice. Um, and I want to find the next group. Um, so just to give you a, a little bit about Getty, um, we were founded 25 years ago. Um, and if you follow our roots back, it takes you all the way back to All Sport Agency. Um, we, for 25 years, we've embraced change and disruption, which has been essential this year with COVID um, and all of the challenges that it's, that it's presented to us. We, we have the biggest sports specialist division of any global agency with over 100 staff photographers. Um, and we're lucky enough to work with 80 sports governing bodies, some of some you know, too many to list, but you, you, you know quite a few of them. And obviously the big three, you know, the big ones in football, FIFA, UA for the Premier League, and then World Rugby, the, the IOC Olympic uh, Committee, um, et cetera, et cetera. There, there's many of them and I won't go over them all, but they are extensive. Those, those give us the opportunity to uh, create unique content. So look, this year has been a huge challenge, um, probably the toughest year that I've ever experienced. Um, and I'm sure that COVID has had an impact on all of your lives because it certainly has mine. I've not actually stepped inside our offices in Camden um, since the end of February um, and miss all of my colleagues. Um, it's, it, it's, it's been such a challenge um, because the smallest, the smallest of tasks that we took for granted have now become so multi-layered that it means that more often than not, our assignment editors are often working 14 hours a day, trying to get photographers out, covering the events and doing what they do best um, and being out there in the field. Um, obviously, you, you know, you probably all know that accredited numbers of photographers are hugely restrictive, um, but we, we're continuing to plan for the future. Um, we've had to embark on different pool scenarios where we share content with competitors you know, we, we don't want this situation to last, but it's been essential um, to supply the content that our clients need. We've had to invest in PPE um, beyond, well beyond uh, the basics of a mask and hand sanitizer. We've spent more money on travel and accommodation than we ever have done. Um, we've been frustrated by so much of COVID, just as I'm sure many of you have. Um, you know, particularly when, you know, when our photographers go to these events, um, you know, we're frustrated by the empty stadiums and the poor backgrounds. It's, it's not what we're used to covering and it's not, it's not, it's not what we aspire um, to look for in our, in our pictures, but we're obviously out there telling the story of how COVID has, has, an, has, has had an impact on sport. Um, but despite all of those frustrations, um, you know, I say we've really tried to look at COVID as an opportunity. Um, many of our photographers switched from, from being sport or entertainment specialists to helping our news desks. They embraced new opportunities with video, um, which is one of our biggest growth areas. Um, and we um, embarked on, a, on an unprecedented curation project where our sports photographers were sourcing archives, creating sets of images for publishers to fill the gaps that were left by the absence of live sport. We've improved our workflows and improved on our editing setup. And we've built much closer relationships with people in the industry outside of Getty. Um, We've actually gone and hired when, when others are looking to scale back, which I think shows you some really, really positive news within the industry. You know, in the US, we've just hired six new sports photographers, four of which are junior positions where we were actively looking for young talent. So, you know, be positive. That may be something that we look to do in other markets and territories. Um, and it's important to be positive and look for those opportunities. 
because to succeed in this industry at the highest level, which I, I, I hope you all aspire to, means that you have to seize opportunity. How, how hungry are you for that opportunity? And how much will you sacrifice to realize those dreams? Because the best of the best have all made sacrifice. Um, when, it come, when, when that opportunity comes, you have to grab it. But the, you know, the rewards are incredible and there is no greater career where you can travel the world at the front line of sports capturing history. The industry is all about sacrifice and commitment. Um, but as I said, the rewards can be phenomenal. Um, and although we're currently restricted by, by COVID, there is a thriving world of sport and photography out there. You know, the next few years are jam packed with major events. And, and, and uh, that's alongside what I call the bread and butter of what we cover in sport, which for us is the, you know, the day in day out coverage of football, tennis, cricket, motorsport, press conferences, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But just because those major events are happening doesn't mean that that's what you have to focus on. Um, you know, there is a, a wealth of opportunity out there and you should, you should be using this time to, to, to show your hunger, to build relationships, to seize the opportunity. Look at grassroots sport, you know, to, to, to make yourself stand out in this. It's not just about attending those big events. It's, it's about understanding the fundamentals of good photography making the best use of light that you possibly can, searching for the best backgrounds, making your pictures stand out. Uh, and like I said, building on relationships because there, there's a wealth of talent out there that's willing to help you um, and give you, give you the, the leg up that you may need um, or, or the, the building blocks to go and you know, have a very active career um, in sports photography. So look around, you know, learn, study the websites, look at the papers and magazines, see what's being used. Um, but look at the story behind it as well. You know, it's, it's not just about the winning celebration. There's so much that goes into covering a sporting event than the winning seller. You know, it's about stock. It's about telling the story. It's about what's going on in the build-up. It's about the, you know, the, best, the best photographers at, uh, at that event are probably the ones that are best prepared. You know, when you look around and you sit in an event, are you, are you hungrier than them? Are you better prepared than them? Do you back yourselves to outshoot them? Those are all things you should be doing because you know, you have to believe that you can succeed because, you know, I, I am evidence you can, you know, I, I started out as a young photographer and you can go out there and there's a, there's an amazing industry out there that any of you can, can go and grab hold of. Um, and, and the sky's your limit. You know, I think it's, it's important to dream big in this, um, and to believe that you can succeed. Um, so look, take your time, um, thinking about this year's entries for the SJA awards. You know, I, I hope as many of you enter as possible. Um, and look, remember, you know, there, there'll only be one winner, but if, if it doesn't work out this, this time, then give it your all next year. You know, look, we will see, we will see things start to open up. We will see numbers of photographers increase again at events. And, you know, it, as I said, it's not just about the high profile major events. It's about grassroots sport. And it's about showing the desire that you have and the hunger that you have to go out and succeed. So um, look, I'm, I'm, uh, I'll be here for the, for the rest of the webinar. So if there's any questions, feel free to, to fire them over. Um, and I'll be delighted to take them after, after James has been through everything else. Thank you very much for that, Paul. That's, uh, I say, let's just hope that, uh, that for a much better 2021, but already you can already sort of see that things are, uh, things are already looking up. Um, right, a bit for me. So um, I, I had a little look earlier about the uh, uh, on the attendees from this webinar, and uh, I can see that some of you are SJA members, but also um, a, a, a lot of you aren't. So I just wanted to just sort of give you a little general introduction, really, about what the SJA is uh, and some of the things uh, that it does. Um, so the SJA is an association of just over 800 members. From, uh, from all areas of the sports media, uh, sports writing, broadcast and photography. It's run by uh, a committee of volunteers. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a hub for industry news. Uh, there's an online members area where there's a members directory which allows you to connect, contact uh, other members, uh, look people up, you can post what you're doing. It's almost like a, like a sort of a mini LinkedIn, I suppose. Um, the SJ runs two main events uh, throughout the year. The SJ British Sports Awards, which is uh, like a, 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 a sports personality of the year, 
and the sports journeys malls, which obviously we're all talking about uh, to, to tonight. Uh, and also they run some other ad hoc events. Uh, the SJA uh, sit on various accreditation panels and act as a, an advisory board for, uh, for, 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 for media facilities. Uh, but I think most importantly, the SJA is a voice for the industry. So whether you're a member or, or, or not, if you work in the industry, have any problems, then the SGA will always try their best to help advise or amplify uh, your voice. Uh, and there's been some good, great examples of, uh, of things that the SGA have done in the past to do that. Um, a recent example has been that the SGA has been working as part of the Sports Freelancer Collective um which is uh, has been set up to assist self-employed and freelance writers photographers and broadcasts broadcasters in various ways throughout the pandemic uh i won't give you the full sales pitch of the sja but they're they're basically there are three levels of membership for whatever stage you are in your career there's student membership um for obviously if you're still in education there's associate members membership if you're looking to break into the industry but maybe aren't a, a, a professional sports photographer yet and then there's uh, there's full membership uh, and memberships are 15 pounds for student membership 20 pounds for associate membership and 30 pounds uh, for full membership so we're not uh, and that's annually so we're not talking about a huge uh, a huge amount of money uh, and there are various benefits of, of membership uh, ranging from full membership there's uh, there's the SJA press card uh, and you can get access to becoming a member of the AIPS, which is uh, the International Sports Journalists Association. Uh, and for student members and associate members, there's uh, access to mentoring and career ad career advice. Uh, but if you want sort of a full a full list of uh, the criteria of what you need to to become a member of the SJA and the benefits of of becoming a member then you can, uh, you can get that on the SJA website, which is just at the bottom of that, that slide there. Um, moving on to the Journalism Awards. Uh, so the SJ British Sports Awards cele celebrate excellence among the country's sports writers, photographers, broadcasters and editors. Uh, there are seven photography categories, uh, with, which has been uh, expanded on, over the last couple of years, one of which being the introduction of the young sports photographer. Six categories can be entered, and then we've got the Sports Photographer of the Year, which is picked, from, uh, uh, which is picked by the judges on who they think has been the best sports photographer that's entered in all of the other categories. Uh, today, obviously, we're going to be focusing on the young sports photographer of the year, uh, the category has been uh, is in its third year, and uh, it, so far it's, it, it seems like it's been a, a real success um, ever since we introduced it. And um, yeah, really pleased with uh, with the entries that we've been receiving uh, year year on year. The, the last year we had more entries in the first year, and obviously hoping for even more this year. Uh, the category is open to photographers under the age of 25 on the 31st. Of December 2020 uh, and previous winners aren't eligible to enter so sorry about that Alex but I think you might be too old anyway now. Uh, entries consist of five photographs representing a variety of sports uh, and a range of photographic disciplines at a variety of sports events um, so uh, I think the guys will cover it later but uh, from sitting in the judging uh, variety I think is the, is, is, is the key. Uh, there's a full list of rules on the awards website, which is the bottom of this slide. But the main main rules really are that the you've got to be pictures that are taken in 2020, and there are certain restrictions on adjustment uh, of, of of the photos. But I'm going to leave that to the experts, uh, who will give you a better idea on what is and what isn't allowed a little bit later. Um, you can enter online. Entries cost. 20 pounds and the deadline is midnight on the 20th of January so you've got a little bit of time to think about your entries if you're anything like most people in the competition it, the, the vast majority of our entries come in the last week but hopefully uh, hopefully you're already at least thinking about it uh, the fact that you're on this webinar means you're thinking about it which is obviously good news uh next just want to cover really wh why why enter what do you what do you guys get out of it well, firstly, it's uh, it's just a great opportunity to get your works uh, seen by the judges. I sit on the I sit 
in on the judging. I'm not a ju judge myself, but obviously administer it. Uh, and both years, the judges have been uh, uh, have been blown away really by the quality of the entries, as Paul, as Paul mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, and they've they've all on both on both. Uh, uh, both times, they both uh, come away saying that there's a there is a mass of young talent in the in, in the industry, and the quality has just been really, really strong. So the top uh, the of all all the entries we get in, the top six, uh, which are selected by judges, form a shortlist, uh, and then from this shortlist, there'll be a bronze, silver, and gold award, which is effectively third, second, and first. It's a bit different to how we've done things in uh, in previous years, but this uh, essentially brings the competition in line with all of the other categories in the competition. Um, and this year we're going to—I mean, the shortlisted portfolios are displayed are going to be displayed on the SJ website, uh, and they're promoted between the shortlist being announced and uh, and the uh, the awards event. Uh, and we're going to do as much as we can about promoting uh, all of the phot photographs that have, that, that have been entered. Uh, of course, the winner receives a nice shiny trophy. I think one of these ones behind me over here. Um, but we're obviously aware also that uh, the, the, the winning isn't everything. Uh, and this year we're, keep, we're really keen in any way we can to showcase all of the entries. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to publish a young sports photographer's gallery after the awards. Uh, which is going to contain a picture from every single portfolio that's entered into the category, whether shortlisted or not. Um, and we're going to do our best to do some features and promote young talent in general ar around that gallery. Uh, and then after the after that initial awards gallery, what we want to do is uh, to continue that really throughout the year with a, a young photographer's picture of the month gallery. So what we'll do is every month, we can uh, we can invite you guys to send in one or two of your best picks. Uh, we will then publish that in the SJ gallery, put it on the SJ website, uh, and through uh, put it, push it through the SJ social channels to really, uh, really basically just trying to promote the, the the work that young photographers are are doing. And we can do some features and and things around that. And I'm sure we'll have uh, we'll have some ideas between now. Uh, between now and the uh, the awards date as well. Uh, so yeah, essentially we are just really looking. If there's any if there's any ways that we can we can promote the, the you and the great work you're doing, then then we want to do it. But that's uh, all right. That's enough for me. Uh, I'm going to hand over to uh, to Jackie, um, who's going to interview our previous awards winners. Hi everyone and thank you for coming tonight. We're going to try and glean whatever we can to find out what it takes to win at the awards. So first of all we're going to speak to Alex Pantling, the reigning champion of the Young Photographer of the Year. So Alex, hope you're doing well. Um, do you want to sort of tell us about how you got into photography? How did your journey begin? Um, <laughs> it was an accident to be honest. It's not something uh, that I was ever that interested in growing up. Um, I always wanted to do architecture um, at school and all that kind of stuff. Um, but unfortunately, the, the, the way that the system worked at school, I don't know if it's still the same now, but he had to pick subjects that fit into certain categories. Um, and I couldn't pick design, which is what I wanted to do. Um, so I had to, had to gamble on photography, um, which, which was a gamble that paid off in the end. It was, um, it was very basic. Um, I don't think many schools actually do, do photography. Um, and it was a sort of thing that you kind of, you got sent out each each lesson to go and take a picture in the local park of something that looked like the letter A, for example. Um, and, then, and then the next week, the B or, or and so on and so on. Um, so it was very, very basic. Um, but I just really enjoyed, enjoyed the course um, and it kind of turned into a bit more of a hobby um, than anything, not something that I ever thought I'd do as a career, um, but I just, just loved, loved doing it. And then got to the age of what 16 17 and uh, all my friends started deciding uh, which university courses they were going to go to and and I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do um, to be honest and took a massive gamble and thought oh yeah yeah why not it's something that I enjoy I'll give it a go I don't know whether I'll be very good at it or not um, but decided to go to Nottingham Trent they accepted me for, for some reason um, and uh, and yeah it was it was great it was something that I absolutely loved doing and I did in my spare time as, as well as the course, really. 
So how did you get serious about it? Obviously you were doing your degree. What else were you kind of doing? Um, so in second year, they, they forced you to go out and do work experience, um, which for me was the best thing about university, really, um, just because it forced you to go out and get a taste of the real work in life. Um, and before second year, so in first year, I was just doing street photography, portraits, et cetera, et cetera, and stuff that I enjoyed, but I always kind of knew I wanted to do sport because that's, that's my main interest outside of photography. Um, and I started emailing football clubs. So in Nottingham, you've got County Forest and you've got Mansfield, uh, Leicester, et cetera. Um, but the one team that replied and, and were happy for me to come in, come and help out was Derby County. Um, so I spoke to them and they let me come and photograph their youth games week in, week out. Um, didn't get any, any money out of it. No, no expenses, absolutely nothing. But it was just great that I could go out and, and shoot every week. Um, and still at this point, to be honest, I was probably still shooting on automatic settings. Um, so I literally had no idea uh, what I was doing, but I knew I needed to stop doing that. Um, so that, that was kind of all of my second year of uni. Um, and then at the same point, I, uh, I uh, got, a, got a message from my tutor. Um, funnily enough, Getty and Nottingham Trent go together hand in hand. Um, the likes of Paul, who's on this course, and Julian Finney, um, plenty of others all went to, to Nottingham Trent. Um, and my tutor at the time actually taught Julian. And she put me in touch with him um, just to try and help me out because um, there wasn't, wasn't many opportunities in sport. I wasn't really getting very far. Um, and he then put me in touch with Michael Regan because Julian was in London um, and Michael was in the Midlands. Um, and he he asked me to go to a Leicester City game with him. Um, being a Leicester fan, it was always a good start. Um, and went and sat pitch side with him at Leicester West Brom, I think. Um, and he uh, he sat me down, got told me to get there probably like four hours before kickoff, sat me down and, and, and basically grilled me for three hours, asking me loads of questions and, and going in on me. Um, asking what I was interested, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it was great. And he seemed to, seemed to like me um, and uh, asked, me, asked me back. And, and the next week he messaged me and asked if I wanted to do a, a commercial shoot with him um, down in Barnet. Um, it was a Nike Harry Kane uh, shoot, just uh, promoting a new jacket or something like that. Um, and he, uh, he said to me, um, he was going to make me get the train down, um, but he decided to drive me for for two hours just because he wanted to see if I could hold a conversation for that long and see, <laughs> see if I, uh, I was someone that he wanted to work with. Um, but yes, yeah, so it was, it, it was, uh, it was all suddenly happening really quick. Um, it was a good conversation then. Well, um, yeah, <laughs> maybe not. But. So how did you, did you apply to be a photographer at Getty or how did that work? Uh, no, no. I mean, it, it's still at this point, um, it wasn't even something that I'd even considered. I was just like happy to be getting involved. Um, and then a job came about as a uh, photo editor. Um, again, I didn't really know too much about what a photo editor was, like, you know, the basics, but um, Michael suggested that I went for, the, went for the job with no experience really. And he said, he said to me at the time, there's no way you'll get it, but it'll be good for you going forward because it's, you know, you'll be on the, on the systems and you know, they'll, they'll know a bit more about you and who you are. Um, so I went for it and obviously ended up getting it, um, which was which was the perfect way to start at the company, really. Um, yeah. Because being a, being an editor is like I, I can't recommend it enough. Um, like I, I went into the company with not much photography experience, a little bit, um, but I gained all that experience in the first weeks of, of becoming a becoming an editor because you, you get to edit for the some of the best photographers in the world, um, and you see there their pictures come in, you get to see how they shoot, um, the, the original frames, the, everything. Um, and it, it was great. It was a great way to start. Brilliant. So this year, was this the first time you've ever entered the awards? Uh, no, no, it wasn't. I entered in 2018 um, as well. Uh, but Naomi Baker went on to win that year. Um, and at the time that was like, I was obviously a bit gutted um, and, you know, kind of didn't really know where to go from there but then the feedback that I got that was that was my um my folio wasn't quite creative enough um I think it was I was really proud of it um it was very clean and you know I, I was really proud of what I put forward but the, the the feedback was that it wasn't creative enough so I decided to then 
following year is continuing working on you know trying to get full in the frame action and clean backgrounds etc but try a little bit harder to get a bit more creative and try and catch uh, catch the judges eyes a little bit better and try to put a portfolio that showed I think as in the description a lot of different skills um, like you can you can see there there's, there's maybe a bit of humor in there um, uh, a bit of uh, a bit of color a bit of contrast um, and a little bit of creativity with, with the silhouettes and the portraits, et cetera, um, as well as doing the standard day-to-day -day job, which is just get full in the frame, celebrations, actions, et cetera. So this is your winning portfolio. Um, tell us about how did you pick it? How did you narrow it down to these five amazing images? Um, it, it started off, you know, from when I got my first picture, to be honest. Um, the, I think the Ronnie O'Sullivan one happened in early January or something like that. Um, and, and that suddenly gave me motivation to go, right, okay, let's, let's put a, uh, you know, just have a folder on my desktop and maybe each week, each other weekend when you get something that you, you're pleased with, um, drop it into that folder. And that, that kept happening throughout the year. Um, and at the end, I probably had a selection of 20, something like that. Um, Come, come December time um, and uh, I uh, you know, we've got this software at Getty called Focus that you can you know you put all your pictures into and you can move them all around and you know place them in different places rank them different things if you want to get rid of them etc cetera, etc cetera, which you know anything can do Lightroom can do this or, or whatever um, but I have found it really helpful for moving things around and you know taking things out etc and seeing how pictures work together um, but uh, th there's a lot of pictures in there that you know, some people told me to put in and, and you know, they, uh, they, they didn't end up uh, making it because other people told me different. Um, and I'm sure most people that are going through this year will find that they'll probably ask, you know, 10 different people what, what they should put in and, and they'll probably all say different things, but you, you know, deep down what you want. Um, it's great to listen to people's advice, but you've kind of collate all of their advice together and, and make your own decision. Um, but for example, there's the swimmer picture there. Um, I think Clive Mason, who's you know won the award several times, he uh, he wasn't that keen on it, and, and he he had a different one that I took the same day that he much preferred. Um, and uh, and in the end, I went for this, and, and it worked out all right. But he still to this day he thinks I made the wrong decision. Um, but uh, but yeah, and then there's other pictures like uh, that that didn't make it that. I was kind of a little bit gutted that I couldn't put them in, which is, I suppose, a good issue to have. But um, thinking about different skills as well, I've never really uh, panned before 2019. Um, and I mm. set that as a little goal to myself just to practice if I can, because it's a new skill and a different, maybe a bit more creative to, to try and fit something else into my portfolio that, that they were asking for. Um, and I was at the, I think it was the diving championships or something along those lines uh, at London. Uh, I don't know, early year. Um, and when everyone went to, I, I covered the competition, and then when everyone went to uh, go and do their lunch, have their lunch breaks, um, the, the athletes still go and stay and practice in the in the pool. So I stayed out um, for about an hour and a half and didn't have any lunch. And, and there was this one girl from, uh, I think she was from Thailand, and she, she, she kept repeating the same drill over and over yeah. again, diving down, getting out of the pool, going to the top, and it, for probably for about an hour. And it was just like perfect for what what you wanted to yeah. do um and i've just sat there and practiced panning again slower and slower and slower and in the end i you know i yeah. nailed one though <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah eventually yeah it probably took me about 50 goes but um i got one in the end that i was really happy with that um i really wanted to put in my portfolio because i was like worked really hard for that and it's something a bit different and you know it was a little goal of mine mm. <laughs> but the people that i asked uh, for advice didn't like it um and at the time I was like, oh, I really want to put it in. Every time I put it into a set, you know, I'd get messages going, what have you done that for? All this kind of stuff. Um, so that, so that didn't make it in the end. And, you know, maybe that was a good thing. Um, so it is important to listen to, to everyone's advice. Um, but, and also try not to think too much about um, your own experiences taking the photos because uh, at the end of the day, they don't know, the judges don't know what you went through to take a photo. All they can, they can see is, is the picture in front of them. So what piece of advice would you give everyone here today when they're trying to think of what to put in and, and how to place the images? What, should, what skills should they be showing? Or um, I think 
you can't obviously you can't go back and take pictures what you've got is what you've got and you work with it as best you can um and uh you, you a big key part to it is is the editing um like i'm pretty sure if i put those five pictures in for the awards unedited you know no one would even look twice um so it's it's really important to within the rules of course to try and make things look as uh as as pretty as they can and and pop colors and you know you know make things contrasty and make things look nice and, and, and stand out um, within reason of course um but yeah try and try and like i said before bring in loads of different skill sets i, th I think it's very important i mean I, I don't know what um what richard just wants specifically but this is from my own experience i thought there's a few standout action well celebration picture um and the 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 swimmer um uh, uh, really stand out pictures for me in terms of um colors and and uh full full in the frame etc etc and i was really they were bankers in my head um and then it, i was trying to think about what could fit around them um the the silhouette of the tennis player um, was again something i worked hard for but I, I know it's been done a few times before so i was a bit hesitant with it um whether to put it in or not but I just felt like when you look at the pictures five like that the, the, the colors really go well together so I think that's that's really important when you are looking at your pictures don't um, don't look at them one by one um, although that might well be what they're doing um, it's important to look at them as a set um, I mean when I was at when I was at uni every day and I don't know whether people are doing this now at uni or whether they used to do this but you'd have to print out your work most days um, and it was quite an arty uni, Nottingham Trent, um, which, you know, I benefited, benefited uh, from. But you, you'd have to put out your work and you'd go through 30 different people in your class and move pictures around, you know, all this kind of thing. So uh, what I wanted to do last year, which I can't say I did, um, but was print out my work, you know, print out your work. If your girlfriend or, or whatever will, will let you have um, your pictures on your wall, then then great, and you can keep looking them every day and see whether you like them. If you get sick of them, you, they know you know they're uh, they're not for you. Brilliant. Well, thanks, Alex. Thanks for your time. Um, as you know, luckily for everyone else, um, Alex is going on to the bigger awards, so you've now got the chance to follow in his footsteps. And we're going to move over to Richard Heathcote. Uh, Getty's senior photographer. He's actually in South Africa. Yes, hopefully we're right. I'm on a <laughs> right, yeah. And what is it you're um, doing in South Africa? Do you want to tell everyone? Um yeah, she is a one of the European tour golf events. So um we work for the European tour, so we have to cover all the events. So myself and another photographer, Warren Little, we're down here for a couple of weeks. Um and the weather's so good over here. Nice. It's warm, yeah, yeah, it's warm. <laughs> We're all cold. It's, it's their summer, so it, it's their <laughs> summer, so it's not really cold. Ah, oh, great. So, so let's hear from you. How um, did you get into photography? How did it work for you? Um, so for me, um, I got into photography really through my dad. It was kind of his hobby. Um, and I kind of just, you know, I think as you do as a kid, you kind of want to do the similar sort of things that you dad or your parents do or whatever or someone you know you spend a lot of time with so I kind of got into it that way um I was probably about probably 14 15 ish that age or 13 14 15 um and just you know something to do it's great you know processing your own, processing your own films um turning the bathroom into a dark room printing pictures that kind of thing yeah um was you know just got me kind of interested in it really and I just um kind of when it came to deciding what to do you know very much like Alex said at uh, the end of uh, school years I kind of decided to do a photography course. And, and where did you go? Uh, I first started well, I left school at 16 and uh, I went I did a A-level equivalent art college course at, uh, in Watford um, and then I did another two years after that that turned it into a degree equivalent in Reading, basically. But again, art college, didn't go to university, went to art college. Um, it was, yeah, it didn't, uh, it was just more of like a life experience and a bit of fun, you know, really, and just you know, yeah. doing something I was enjoying and learning whilst I was, into it, whilst I was doing it. 
So then what happened next? How did you get that into a career? Um, so I, uh, probably about my third-ish year in art, in, in art college, I decided I wanted to shoot sport, um, try and go down that avenue. And there was actually someone else in the year above me who was doing some um, assistant work um, with Bob Martin, who's very well known in the industry. I'm sure everyone on the call knows who Bob is. Um, and I kind of messaged him to see if there's anything available. Never heard back. Never heard back. Um, that's just the way things are, you know. You know. I'm sure he gets a lot of people, like you everyone does. Find him. <laughs> yeah, exactly, if you can get hold of him. Yeah. Um, but even so, I wasn't deterred. I knew it was still kind of what I wanted to do. Um, and as I finished college, there was kind of, it wasn't a lot of, um, I wasn't, I, you know, I sent like a small failure up to all sport. Uh, sent one to all the other agencies as well. Didn't really hear back much. Um, eventually heard back from uh, Action Images, which is it's an ongoing thing through some of us here. Um, got the opportunity to come in and like, you know, Paul was offered um, to work in the dark room. I was offered to work in the dark room, but at the time, the sum I was offered was a lot less than my rent and I couldn't afford it. I literally could not afford to take the job. Um, I was, you know, uh, I was freelancing up in London doing like celebrity photo calls, premieres, like little news jobs, just bits and pieces to get myself into the industry somewhere. Um, and I was kind of a little bit like, mm, you know, it's, I like, it, I kind of knew it's where I wanted to be, but I just, sometimes finances don't allow. Um, mm. I was a bit, oh, okay. But, Within three or four months, I had a phone call from them saying, oh, we're we actually going to do something else. Would you like to come in? And that was just like, yeah, I was like, a, you know, bizarrely ended up being on money I could actually live on. And, um, and uh, I got myself in that way, started, I was doing everything and anything, anything from darkroom bits. I was doing like working on servers, computers, stuff like that. I was pretty much doing anything and everything um as well as going out and you know being that tech processing films for photographers scanning sending um yeah the old school sort of darkroom way that you know, mm. the older generation which was say within the industry found the traditional way into the business uh, <laughs> brilliant and so then how did you get from doing all the processing and sort of being on the back end to then being in the sort of front line at Getty, taking pictures, doing the things you really love? So, um, I won't lie, I was pretty stubborn when it came to, when I was at Action Images, it was kind of like, um, uh, the person there at the time running it was like, oh, well, maybe you're better off just doing stuff in the office, yeah, doing this in the office, doing, yeah, looking after the, this or that, and maybe doing pictures and stuff. But I knew I still wanted to be a sports shop. I wanted to push, push, push. So I eventually was doing more and more um, full-time sport there. And I, I, I was there for nearly seven years in the end. Um, and then in 2004, um, I saw a little opportunity um, through a few of the Getty photographers that I knew I kind of pushed, put, I kind of put myself forward um, to um, the then uh, director of photography to, to say, look, this is what I, you know, have you got anything? You know, is, you know, I, I'm, you know, I would like to, uh, you know, see if there's an opportunity for me to come work for you. And it was an interesting one because at the time, because when I was at Action Images at the time, I probably could have almost, I wouldn't say picked what I wanted to do, but I, I was, you know, I was, Pretty much, I could, you know, I'd been put on all the bits, you know, all the right, you know, all, all the games you'd want to be, all the trips. You know, I was, I was shooting along with the other main guys there, um, but I kind of wanted to challenge myself a little more. I kind of wanted to, sort of, see how good I was. And I, I'm, I'm not a very competitive person, but I just kind of felt like I wanted to, I needed to find out, you know, if, if I, you know, I wanted to learn more basically, and I, and I felt I. I, I could always I could learn more by going and working with you know the essentially what's the best collection of sports photographers around. So 
Um, yeah, I was very lucky. Um, uh, had an interview, got offered a job, and then that's yeah, that was 2004, and here I am, you know, sort of 16 years later, still very much you know, enjoying it. And, and what's one of the sort of biggest changes you've seen in your role? Because, I mean, obviously, you've got quite a good technical background, especially in computers and things. What are the other yeah. things that your role involves? So now um, I'm very much sort of embedded with our, we have like a major events team um, that is obviously, you know, major events, things like Olympics, World Cups, um, all those big events, they take a lot of planning and a lot of, you know, you know, Paul and all the assignments team guys and then all the other technical guys, they put so much work in behind the scenes to make these events work for us. Um, we have to put in so much planning on these things. So you know, things like the Olympics, we're planning, you're planning for an Olympics almost four years out. So, you know, you, you're kind of, as one finishes, you know, say, oh, I know we're a bit off kilter at the moment with this year, but traditionally you would have um, you would have what we call like our world press briefing for the Olympics would be within about three months of the previous one finishing. So you can, you know, there's not really much, you know, time before you move on to the next one. You know, we, we've already done several site visits um, to Qatar for the World Cup and planning there. And um, we're already very deep into Beijing plannings for the Winter Games. And it's, it's going to be a very, it's going to be very interesting going from a Summer Games to a Winter Games within six months. Um, that requires a lot of planning, you know, to move stuff uh, from our side and, and also obviously from Canon side, shipping CPS stuff from, you know, from various places around the world into Tokyo yeah. and, and, and into Beijing, dealing with customs and things. And, but, you know, we have um, a lot of the pictures you'll see, actually, you might, when you look at, when you get to see my phone, you'll see some images that are shot from above looking down. Um, there's been a lot of, you know, there are a lot of traditional angles that we would always go and, you know, shoot from catwalks and things. And, and in some of the old days, people would just go up there and just take your camera, stick it over the side. And, you know, big world of health and safety these days, you can't do that. Um, you know, you've got to be fully trained. So, yeah, we're height trained. We have full harnesses and all, all the lanyard and, and safety equipment we need. Um, we also now install, um, robotic cameras above um, sports. And this is, th th yeah, this was brought on, actually, actually came to, it started really with London 2012, where there's a lot of sports that traditionally you want angles from above. Um, and it just wasn't possible because there was no catwalks for people to go up there. So there was a solution and the solution was kind of, you know, it was kind of brought together between the London Olympic photo team, um, the camera manufacturers and independent sort of, robotic uh, head manufacturers and it's kind of developed from there when when now it, it's almost become the norm when you go to a major event it's like well okay well we can put one there there then we can do this and this i mean i mean and still you always want to be able to put a person somewhere because you know a person can make a decision you know, you can move something here or there, you, you can make decisions, you can change lenses a bit easier, you, you can see things differently. Um, but when that's not possible, then technology then comes in and assists us um, to, uh, to kind of, you know, um, get images that you wouldn't be able to because yeah. you can't get it, because you can't get access. Yeah, it's a really interesting story in itself to... Yeah think about all the sort of automated imaging that does go on as well. So it's not just around the pitch or the venue. Um, yeah. Going on to the SJAs. Yes. Now, I know you've entered a few times. Just once or twice. <laughs> How many times have you entered? Um, it's got to be close to uh, somewhere, maybe up to 20. Yeah, maybe up to 20. Um, there's a few years where we couldn't all enter, but that was all years. I mean, it's funny. So when I, when I first started, I, you know, like it's like the end of the nineties, the SGA awards was in, it's so different to what it is now. It, it's come so far. It really has come so far. And I, I remember the first one, one or two, it was basically prints on the wall in a little, little, um, 
sometimes not quite a pub but um in like a little exhibition room or or somewhere very close to a pub we'd already been into and there was basically everyone was mingling having a good laugh chatting with everyone you know trays of beers going around and could get quite raucous um but it was it, it it's amazing to see how far it's come it is it, it truly is it's expanded beyond belief and, the, and obviously like the support that then comes in um has been quite incredible so yeah. and now and now you've finally one how did that feel? yes that was very very surreal because it's not you know it's uh, for us as sports photographers in the uk it's the one that we want to win if we, if you yeah if there's there are many other competitions and there are many other international competitions but if you're a sports photographer in the uk this is the one that you want to win it's got the history more than any other award um you know, you look down the, the names on the trophy and there's like the you know, guys who pioneered the industry, you know, Chris Smith, Amy McKay, you know, then you come through the ages and you've got photographers that, you know, sort of really challenged how people done things like you know, Bob Martin and um, uh, Mike King. And then you move forward through the years and, you, you know, you've got people who are you know, still very much at the top of the game of the industry, you know, Michael Steele. Um, Tom Jenkins, that you know, that it, it's just, yeah, it, it was too, it, yeah, very, it was very, it was very, surre very surreal, but also extremely, you know, extremely you know, sort of satisfying. Brilliant and well deserved. So tell us about this portfolio and the images here. How did you think? Right. Yeah, so, okay, so yeah, I, quite a decent year last year <laughs> um so i kind of it's interesting I, i'll hold my hands up that traditionally i am always someone who or always have been someone who would look at the pictures i've taken and think more about what i put into it uh, like, like alex alluded to earlier it's like you you have to it's very hard to, to take the emotional detachment out of something you've put a lot of work into um so I, I kind of this year or well, last year, I kind of like, I, I went through a process of moving pictures in and out, but I just kind of thought, well, no, just try and let it have a flow. You know, don't try and be clever and put a black and white in there just for the sake of putting a black and white frame. You know, leave color, you know, we, you know, let's, you know, let, let's you know, look for something, look for a bit more kind of impact on things, a bit more kind of, and again, you know, you know, try and have a nice mix of, you know, things that are relevant, things that are topical, things that are graphic, um, something that kind of like, you know, really grabs you and make you look at it as well. Um, and and find that there's a picture in here that only went into the folio about, about a week before I submitted it. And that's the swimmer with the prosthetic eye yeah. and I, that picture was in and out in and out in and out because i wasn't sure about it it's like it's kind of got a bit of a a sort of a i suppose a little bit of a shock value to it um but the reason it ended up in or a reason i ended up putting it in in the end instead of a picture that i actually really liked um was because it got shortlisted in another awards um somewhere else and i thought oh okay well maybe it is a good one to put in maybe it does kind of like provoke people to think about well that's different that's weird you know and and i think sometimes that's that's about it and i mean if you look at you know if you look at those 10 images okay right you know there's probably of those 10 images three of them there i would say most people on this call could tell you what they are you know and that's obviously the anthony joshua mega rapino and then the um, england all blacks from the um from the world cup semi final all the other images on there they're not it's not like oh wow look there's like you know that's like this is the winning moment from this event or you know yeah this is the you know this is this most amazing superstar person they're they're for me it's about trying to find a nice balance of a nice you know this is sports photography you know you, you, ha you have to be led by the picture you have to be led by how the each you know almost how each individual picture grabs you as you look at it but also how they fit um you know there's things in there that are slightly different and unique angles like the remote from the goal and um which is the second on the top line you know that's a again, go back to the technology that's a tiny little camera 
that is mounted in the top of the net through it's something that we've you know along with you know, others have worked with FIFA and through our relationship with FIFA um, we got to install the camera in there but it's potluck you know you, you can have a goal that end you don't know you know you're gonna is it gonna come your way you don't know is it gonna get is it gonna get wiped out probably you know uh, I uh, I put one in the in the goal for the Champions League final so the the Liverpool Spurs and it was Mo Salah penalty in the second minute of the game. It, the ball hit the camera, and I didn't really have a picture out of it. But you know, all the work that had gone into putting it, and the basically the camera was out of action within two minutes of the game, and I couldn't change it until half. I couldn't reset it until half time. So yeah, there's a little bit of you know, every single person will tell you there's a there's an element of luck um, in, in in things happening in front of you, um, but there's also you know, there's the concentration, um, there's the thought process, you know, there's probably, of, of, of those pictures there, there's three of them that are preconceived pictures, totally preconceived. Um, that's the uh, the hacker picture. Um, I wanted to shoot the England, uh, you know, I wanted to go up and I wanted to shoot the England team looking at the hacker. I had no idea they were gonna line up like they did. I had no idea that's how it was gonna come out that's the element of luck. But, you know, that picture came out as pretty much as I was kind of seeing. Um, the other one that's preconceived um, is the uh, long jumper going into the sand. Um, that is shot from the catwalk and that's me up in the catwalk with a 600 mil basically dangling over, you know, harnessed up, looking over the hand holding a 600 looking over. Um, I was probably about, uh, probably about 60 meters up. It was rather huge. Mm. It's, it's from Qatar. It's pretty warm that year. Um, and then the other one is the bike pan. I mean, I, mean I, I that's just from you know that's just from a Donington superbikes. It's not yeah, sorry British super yeah you know, sort of British superbikes. It's not even like you know like the top of the top race. It's but I knew I wanted something. I went there with a the thought. Oh, I want something with a bit of colour. So I looked for you know I did a little loop of the circuit. I worked out where the best colourful backgrounds were what would work for a nice slow pan. And I just waited and I shot a couple of races there and I probably got four or five pictures that are similar, but that one works because of the colors on the bike also uh, yeah, kind of accentuated with the colors of the pan's advertising board. Brilliant. It's, and it's a great set. Um, what piece of advice would you, would you give us on, on entering and trying to put a portfolio together, particularly after a difficult year? Um, it has been a very difficult year and there's going to be a lot of people that are going to think, what, what have I got this year? What have I shot? And thinking like, oh, I've got, I've got something, oh, that's nice, but I've got empty back. You know, I think you, this particular year, I think you have to embrace the year. I think you have to, um, I think we, because this is such a unique situation, I, I personally feel you almost have to, we kind of almost have a little, a little bit of a duty to kind of tell the story of this year within folios. Okay, yeah, you know, you, you can still get a phenomenal, beautiful set of images and you could look at them and you might think, well, that could be the same as any year. But I think within a set, you know, I'm not saying every picture, but I think within a set of pictures this year, there should be, a couple that you know tell the story of this year you know this is something that's never happened in any of our lifetimes hopefully never happens ever again in, ever, in any of our lifetimes um i think it's a unique opportunity to kind of you know for um, to, to see pictures that you just we don't see normally you know you, you take this year and unfortunately with no spectators in stands um, we've actually been had the opportunity to go and work from stands more than we would do normally. You know, Premier League games, we'd never work from stands because we're thinking, oh, I've got to be here, I've got this, uh, I need to sit in front of the away fans. And now we're thinking, like, I'll tell you what, this, this is a nice kickoff this, this time of day. There could be a nice patch of light in that corner of the stadium. I quite fancy working up there for 20 minutes or half an hour or maybe I'll spend the game up there. You know, and, and it, it's been good because it's actually... I think it's made a lot of photographers think more about the content they're going to produce instead of being turned on automatically or, or, or sort of think, oh, okay, yeah, right, oh, right, my schedule is I've got this game, this game, this game, right, what, what do I need? Oh, yeah, I need that, 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 and I'll make sure I've got my remotes for this. Um, I think it's made a lot of people think more, and I think that shows in 
in the content that's been produced across a lot of people this year in the last nine months. So I mean, I, I would, I would, I, I would, yeah. I think I think you still got a, you know, I think it's important a picture's a strong picture. You can't just and a strong picture is something that you look at and you think, oh, that's nice. Or you look at it and you keep looking at it. If you look at something once, you know, oh, that's all right, yeah, yeah. Then maybe it's like your strongest picture. Maybe it's not something that you you think, oh, okay. But if you think about a picture, you, you, you look at something and you start looking at it and you think, hmm, okay, yeah, I quite like that. Why do I like it? And you know, then you can cut down on your pictures. Then you have to start thinking about well, what fits together. Uh, like Alex said earlier, yeah, when you're picking a set, something, um, one of our more senior photographers who's actually quite good at picking folios um, was said to me, he said, well, whatever you do, make sure you have a bit of humour in there. You know, like Alex said earlier, have, may I have, have something in there that makes you laugh. The picture top left of mine of the GB girls messing around, sort of, you know, sticking their tongue out to, uh, like, towards me because I was messing around taking pictures. I would never pick that normally for a folio. It just wouldn't, something I would pick. You know, because to me, in my eye, it's not really that clean. There's water bottles in it. it, it the girl who's looking the other side. But then, you know, you know, in the context of everything else, it brings the set together. It just, you know, makes you, yeah, sort of emotion. a little. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the thing, sport, like, you know, so, you know, sport's an emotional thing, you know. So, you know, if you don't, you know, if you just produce 10 beautifully clean, wonderful pictures that don't show any emotion, but they're stunning pictures. And yeah, they're nice, but you know, there's something missing in the overall, in the overall set. And the other thing is like, um, Paul and Alex said, I'm sure Dickie will say the same. It's like, it, it, it's, ask us, talk to people, ask people's opinion, because you know, you, you, it's, it's very, very, very easy to get stuck in a rut and, and, and very easy to, it's very easy to kind of think, oh, I like this. I like, and I think, no, no, I want this. I want this. I want this. I, 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 want, oh, yeah, I want this is my picture. And, um, it, but you need other people's opinions because at the end of the day, it's other people judging your pictures. So, you know, you, by engaging other people, by asking their opinions, then you, you're going to get, even if you go and make your own decision afterwards, which you should, you know, you've got people's informed opinions and, you know, I genuinely, yeah, you know, I think you, you know, you, if you ask a, the question of any of us, you will get an honest response, and it's an honest response because, you know, from my point of view, I, I want to see the new talent coming through. I want, you know, I, you know, I take really great joy in basically helping other people, like learn and gain confidence in doing things, and and then just seeing them work things out for themselves and then create their own style um and then take that forward you know i i if i give advice to someone i don't want them to be a carbon copy of me or what i do i want them to f hopefully take some of the you know the experience the advice i would give and they take what they want from that and then they add that to say they get it from someone else and then they you know they mix that with their own ideas and their own style and that, and that creates them as a photographer and that develops them as a photographer you know, I think we're very we're we're very very lucky in the respect that um, we have such a diverse collection of photographers that are all, you know, there's, some photographers are fantastic at certain sports and I, I wouldn't say dreadful at other sports, but you know, aren't as good as others. And then it's the reverse for many others. You know, you know there are you you find you know you, you shouldn't you know get disheartened if you get. I, I personally I hate horse racing. I don't really enjoy going to horse racing. I don't really shoot much horse racing probably because I like, I don't really like it, but if I had to go and do it, I'd go and do it obviously. But it's like, I, I, but I know it, it, it's a favorite of a lot of people and it does make fantastic pictures, but personally it's not really my thing. So that's fine. I, you know, I, I, I look at what I enjoy doing and I, you know, I, I, you know, I, that for me, I, that enthusiasm then goes in on, on those things and that, you know, I think you, you you take the effort that you have or the drive you have, and you just go at something, and you, and you know you you know, you'll keep trying, keep trying, you know, and you'll come up with something. Never be, you, no one should ever be like, like scared of failing on something or or, or not. Um, you know, thinking, oh God, if I enter these, you know, like for five pitches for the junior thing, what are they going to think? what are they going to think of me if I put these five pitches in and I don't win? It doesn't matter. 
because only one person can win doesn't worry it does it doesn't matter you learn by you know, putting something in and getting feedback um you know and and, and you're only going to get better by getting feedback you're only going to get better by asking advice and then just you know picking things up and and, and then running with it really brilliant thank you thank you richard we look forward to right. seeing what you can come up with this year actually um, um, so yeah <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy South Africa and yeah. we go over to Thank Richard you. Pelham. Good evening. <laughs> Wonderful speeches by Alex and uh, Paul and Richie. Well done. Wow, brilliant. Richard Pelham, 30 years at the Sun, is it? Uh, yeah, 30, 31 years now. 31 years. 31 years filling those back pages of the Sun that we all love. Thank and you. some centre spreads as well, I'm sure. So, where did it all start? How did we get you to being on the Sun and Wow, it started. It it started at probably fourteen years of age when I was at the Farrock Camera Club, when I was uh, bought my first camera for Christmas, and that's where it's all started. Local parks, photographing silhouettes, churches, everything really. Uh, I got quite lucky because my mother worked for a local paper, so she got me some uh, weekend shifts. And I was uh, going along and photographing, photographing Grey's Athletics. So I suppose that's where I got my love for shooting football. I was doing Grey's Athletic at 15 years of age. Okay. Uh, won Junior Photographer of the Year when I was about 15 there. Uh, and then I was into catering. I was going to be a chef. Uh, but then uh, I think it was my mum. She she saw uh, an advert uh, for an agency in Fleet Street called Universal Pictorial Press, and I didn't go to the catering interview. And I went for an interview at Universal Pictorial Press when I was sixteen, and I uh, I got the job. Uh, I missed the catering exam, and I left school on a Friday, and I was in the big wide world of Fleet Street on Monday morning, and I started as a messenger at uh, Universal Pictorial. Same sort of, you know, thing as uh, Paul Gillam, you know, and uh, the rest of the guys, you know, you started down there and built your way up. So I was a messenger. And what were you shooting at um, UPPI? At UPPI, I did not have a camera in my hand for, uh, in anger, for probably 18 months. I was a messenger, I was a T-boy, I captioned pictures. Then I got the break after about 13, 14 months. I was into the dark room and I was, I was printing pictures. I knew how to print photographs because I, I was doing it at the local camera club. But by then, you know, you're spending all your money and building your kit up and you're getting a little bit of a kit together. And, you know, I broke the bank and I bought my first 300 mil lens, 300 <laughs> 28. So do you just want to explain to the guys what um, a messenger is? Because they might not know. No, a messenger in them days was uh, you'd come in at nine o'clock in the morning and the the print run would all be printed up to deliver the stock images, stories to newspapers, etc, etc. So that took three hours to walk around Fleet Street to deliver all them pictures to every single paper. Then you'd be coming back and you'd be getting people's lunches and things like that. You'd be captioning pictures all afternoon. And then if a major story broke again, you'd be delivering them images around Fleet Street to the major papers for the big stories. So that was what the messenger's job was. It was, you know, a general, a general dog's body, but it was a great way of learning. It was a great way of learning. It was a great way of learning, earning respect from people as well, because, you know, it, you know, you were delivering pictures in the rain, cold, and then it was the hot of the summer. So it was good. And so then I got the break. I got into the dark rooms. I got into the dark room, so I was printing them pictures in them days. But then by then, as I say, I had a little bit of a wage coming in, and I spent everything. I bought my, bought my first 300 mil, and uh, I went to my uh, beloved West Ham, and that's where I sh started shooting football and really got the love for shooting football, probably by about 17 or 18. So would you say football is your favourite sport, or is there others? I would, yeah, 100% football, yeah. I wasn't bad at it. I used to love playing football, but photographing football any day of the week. Secondly, definitely boxing. Love boxing. I admire what boxers put their bodies through. I'm no boxer. I did a bit of boxing training yesterday. I'm stiff as hell. So, yeah, I love, I, I love boxing. 
love cricket, like doing cricket in the summers, things like that. People say, oh, you must be mad going to a test match, but I'd sit at a test match, listen to a radio and try and take some nice pictures any day of the week. Same as what Richard said, there's no way you get me at horse racing, but if I have to go to a horse racing, I will go to a horse racing. And the same as rugby, I, I just, I never played rugby. I don't photograph rugby. I've done a little bit of darts, don't mind photographing darts. Darts is pretty good, that's all right. The one sport I do love, we'll come on to a bit later, is the Olympic Games. And we'll come on to that a bit later. So how did you work your way to the sun? How, how did that happen? Well, <laughs> after some time at Universal, you know, you get in, you want to do more, but you're being held, I was being held back in the sporting because it was a showbiz, a showbiz agency. And I was photographing a lot of the royal family in, in, that, in that time, Princess Diana Ferguson. So I went to an agency called Alpha Press Agency. And there wasn't no sport at all there. But I was getting to photograph the members of the royal family the proper way, the, the right way. Uh, but then, you know, I was, I was missing sport too much. I got to do Wimbledon for two weeks. And then in about, I think it was about 89, <clears throat> Peter Jay left the sun. And I sent a cheeky letter to the picture edit at the Sun to find out if I could be the sports photographer on the Sun. And I thought I would never get a reply. Got the reply. Uh, and they just rang me up out of the blue and they said, can you photograph a football match for me? And I went, of course. I went, yeah, of course I can. No problem at all. And put the phone down and it was like, oh my God, I've got a shift on the Sun. <laughs> and and the game was cheeky. Wednesday night and it was Chelsea versus Norwich. And the films were sent back to the dark rooms. I didn't have to do anything. <laughs> uh, I continued to work for Alpha in the daytime, and I was getting more and more shifts on the sun. Uh, and it was just getting too hectic. So I had to leave Alpha and went to the sun. Uh, I was shooting news, uh, and I was shooting sport at the same time. But mm. from 89 to 94, I was a freelance and then I was taken on the staff from 94 at the Sun. And so in 94, when you were a young photographer, you covered yep. one of your favourite events that had a really big impression on, on you. Do you want to tell us about that and how you felt when you were so young for such a big opportunity? <laughs> well, it was, it, was, it was a couple of years down the line. It was 96. And, you know, it's like Paul Gillam saying to one of his photographers for the first time, you're going to the Olympic Games. Uh, my picture editor called me in and I thought I was in a little bit of trouble and he said oh, I've got some news for you and I said what's that he said you're going to the Olympic Games in 1996 in Atlanta and it was like I was, I was just shell shocked <clears throat> you know you're going into the big league uh, in them days it's not like today's days you're taking 400 hours day films 1600 hours day films you was taking mobile dark rooms cameras everything uh, the heat, the humidity there, I've never known anything like it. Um, the graft was just like eight in the morning till one, two o'clock in, in the evening. It was just relentless. <clears throat> and I was I was quite lucky, you know, I started off well. It was against the five hour time difference as well, which was an absolute killer, as any photographer would tell you in them days, shooting with negative. It It was hard. It was going well. We was getting great shows in the paper. And I think it was about the Thursday night and there was this uh, race going to happen with Michael Johnson. He was racing for the uh, 200 metres and he absolutely obliterated the Olympic record. And it's probably uh, one of my best ever pictures to date. It, it was incredible. But I went back to the dark rooms and put it in for processing when I've got a cup of tea and I knew I had this picture. I just knew I had this picture. <laughs> Came back. And we had a, an old, uh, uh, a dead man called Marcello. And he was, he was such a keen photographer. And he knew I had something. And he dried it with a hairdryer. And I kept saying, Marcello, be careful with that. Be careful with that. And he was just taking his time. And he, he said in this Italian voice, I will look at the picture, not you. And he, he looked at the picture. And he just came up and he went, Dicky, it is a belter. And when I looked at it, it was just an amazing image. And we couldn't get it in the paper that night. So it was waiting for next day because of the time difference. And yeah. when I got the picture, you know, I think I got called at about seven o'clock in the morning. It was like, what do you want? I've been working all night. And it's like, this image you've got of Michael Johnson, it's incredible. I went, oh, great, thanks. Brilliant. And I think they, 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 they said, 
because it was Friday morning. They said, oh, you might as well be finished at the Olympic Games now. You know, you're done for. And it's like, no, I'm staying for the closing ceremony. I've done the opening ceremony. I've seen Muhammad Ali. I photographed the bomb going off in Centennial Park on the Saturday night. I've seen Linford Christie dis- disqualified because he was the reigning champion. I've got Michael Johnson. I'm certainly staying to the end of the Olympic Games. <laughs> Oh, what a brilliant first first Olympics. And if yeah. you got a picture like that today, you'd have to get it out in seconds. Otherwise, it wouldn't be worth it. So, I think you're right. And, and also, also, two or three people would have that picture. To get that one image to myself, <clears throat> I'll say it myself, it's a history picture. Not many people have got that image, the way you come across that line, showing the scoreboard and the time and the, what, what Johnson did. Brilliant. So, you're a bit of a legend when it comes to winning awards. How many photo awards have you actually won? This is embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's only, as, as Richard says, there's only one award to win, which is the SJA Holy Grail, Sports Photography of the Year. I have won versions of Sports Photography of the Year. So, I've won Sports Photography of the Year seven times. I've won individual single picture awards as picture of the year about four times. Uh, my book, my book, I'm an author now. So and my book has won uh, the Telegraph Illustrated Book of the Year. And I recently won the Sportel Book Awards as well. And that means a lot because that's 30 years worth of work. People have bought the book. Judges have looked at that book and I've been up against other things. So I was really proud to, you know, win that award for my book as well. <clears throat> that was a great night because someone had to uh, present the award to me that night and she didn't know I was getting it either, did you? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Richard won three awards on, on the one night and um, I had to read it from the envelope. And I don't like to know before I go up there because it spoils the moment. And as I started pulling the postcard out and reading it, I realised who it was. So it was a great moment and it always is no matter who wins, but um, it was mm. a great night. Um, let's have a look at your portfolio that sort of got, got you to there on that night. Can you just tell us a bit about it, how you chose it, how it came together? Well, it was to win sports photography of the year with a football portfolio, I think has never been done. So that was a, a real great first for me. <laughs> I always... I, uh, we'll talk about it a bit later, but I always try to start my portfolios with a bang to get the judges interested. Uh, and I think I started it with the picture of Antonio Conte. Chelsea had won the league. I remember that picture vividly on that night. I was in a position that I shouldn't have been. I was working in the corner, but no one was bothering me. <laughs> but all the players had walked past me. Conte walked past me past me and all of a sudden they just picked up Conte the players mm-hmm. over the far side of the field and they threw him in the air and for some reason Chelsea put the champions all around the edge of their uh, the top of the stands and it was just framed perfect for me uh, so as I said I always try to start the portfolio with a bang to get the judges interested like oh we want to see the rest of this portfolio the second picture I definitely put in that I remember was Olivier Giroud and that was taken on January the 1st and I, and I remember I had flu on that day and I did not want to go to work. I was dying but I, I, I said no, I've got to do my job. I'm not on holiday. I've got to go to the game. It was pouring with rain. I walked in with about 10 minutes to spare for kickoff because I was just so ill and he scored this goal and, and they called it the Scorpion goal because he didn't look it and he kicked behind him. And I knew it was quite a good picture. People told me that was a good picture, that Olivier Giroud, he won the FIFA goal of the year with that actual goal. And they used that picture to prescribe it as the picture. So that was, that was definitely going in the portfolio. <clears throat> Jamie Vardy, I've never seen a, a player punch himself in frustration after missing something. I love boxing, so I probably timed it pretty good. The action picture, it was okay. It wasn't the best, but it was, wasn't was okay. The Jose Mourinho picture with the bubbles in it, the bubbles really helped it. Jose Mourinho had a great funny face. The picture of the player, <clears throat> someone had handed him some team notes. They brought some team notes on. 
and he was reading the team notes, looking down, and someone played the ball to him, and I just thought it was just a funny picture. Uh, Sissoko with uh, Mark Noble at the London Stadium. <clears throat> someone said to me, it's just a funny picture, a little man squaring up to a big man like that. It was in a London derby, being a West Ham player. I suppose my uh, heart uh, ruled my head, and that's why I stuck it in. I really wanted a, a, a funny picture. Someone said, you've got to end this with a funny, funny picture. Uh, and it was from Chelsea when they uh, won the league. I did not put a single trophy picture in. I've got no trophy pictures in that portfolio. It was just William and Diego Costa, and they got some cameras off the fans, and they did selfies to the, uh, with the players and the fans. And it, it just made it funny. And as for the Jamie Vardy remote, it was just, just a nice uh, composed picture. It was just a nice remote. It's probably one of my best remotes of the, you know, of the year. That's why I put it in. The pictures of the uh, Arsenal players celebrating was for the North London derby. <clears throat> and I, I tweeted it and someone said, oh, look at the emotion in every single player. So really, by Twitter, people coming back to me saying, oh, that was a really nice picture. You had all the emotions of a London derby. That's why I, I stuck it in the folio. So that, that's yeah. the main reason, really. I said, I, I think, I remember Alex Pamplin last year, where he definitely showed me his portfolio and he was with someone, and I won't mention who it is. And I said to him, start your portfolio with a bang. And that other person said, no, 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 you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. You're not interested in that. But I said, I always start my portfolio and you know, look at Alex's portfolio. It was just superb. It was a great folio. When you when you see it straight away, you knew he was going to have problems choosing his five for that portfolio. Great position to be in. Definitely. What advice would you give our young photographers here tonight? What advice? Don't don't give up. As <clears throat> Richard said, <clears throat> this year has been an absolutely terrible year with COVID. You know, we've all had to go out and find our own jobs and you've got to do that as well you know go out and find your own jobs I follow some of the the young guys on Instagram and they're going out and they're finding different different stuff all the time they're, they're and they're raising the bar they've gone out and found jobs to photograph when well, you can't go to professional sport they're going out they're going to amateur sport and grassroots sport so you know they're finding good images it's the same as what <clears throat> I had to do you know I was a newspaper photographer I was on the front line photographing nurses. I was having to photograph the beaches in, in this time. He just got on with it. And when it got a little bit more relaxed, I was using my contacts. I was going to photograph Olympians at home. I was photographing boxers at home and I was just doing as much as I could until I was one of the lucky ones going out and shooting football in pool positions. It was quite lucky. It's very, very hard for people. You've just got to keep going, keep fighting and someone on Sunday, I'm not going to, I won't embarrass the person. She said, uh, he said, she said, I've only got four images. I said, well, go out there and go to a grassroots event and get your fifth picture, get your fifth shot for your portfolio. And then you'll build your set. And the person, I'll say the person, the person, I said, that's a great set. All you need is one more. Just go out there. You've got a month now to go out and get that final image. And that person Instagrammed the picture and I just direct messaged her. I went, what are you moaning for? You've already got your five now. But people don't realise that. You know, they want the confidence. Someone to help, help them, I think. So, you know, I need help. I go to Carl, Carl Rossini. He helped me pick that folio. And my picture editor, who's not a sports picture editor, he's a news picture editor, he helped me pick that folio as well. You definitely need advice, what Richard said. You need other people's advice. Yeah, take all the advice you can get, I think, it is the Definitely. key. Definitely, because I was always helped when I was a messenger. I, you know, I was always asking for advice and people help me, so that's why I'll help people. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, thank you all for your sort of inspiration tonight and telling us what can be done. Um, over to you, James. Hi there, guys. Uh, well, that was really, really interesting stuff. And uh, thank you very much, Jackie uh, and Richard, Alex and, uh, and Richard. 
We've uh, we've had a few questions uh, come in, so I'll start on sort of the competition related questions, and then sort of maybe move on a little bit just to the general industry questions. Uh, I've had a question here from Morgan Harlow. Do photos have to be taken at an official sporting event, or can they be from uh, from a grassroots or training environment? Paul, uh, as a sort of a previous judge, uh, I'll let you answer that one. Yeah, and I, I, absolutely. They can, they can be from all, all walks of sporting life. Um, it doesn't doesn't have to be from an event. Doesn't have to be from a professional event. Can be can be grassroots. Can be something you see in your local park. You know, as long as long as it's sport sport relevant, um, then then absolutely it can be it can be from anywhere. We're cer certainly not looking uh, in in any category, whether that's you know the young photographer or the football portfolio or. The, the sport portfolio, the specialist for it all to come from professional sport. You know, I, I, rem I, remember, I remember a few years back when, you know, there were some really good portfolios that were shortlisted in, in specialist category and, and, and the judge, you know, the judging commentary was, was, well, where is the grassroots? You know, it's like, if, if it's all high end, it's, that's, that's great. Um, but, you know, you want to see, you want to see that, that desire. You want to see somebody having an understanding of sport and that starts from, from the lower level you know it could it could be a, a kids game of football that it doesn't matter you know it's it's just about going out there understanding sport mm -hmm. making the most of the light you know really really trying to make your picture stand out and that could that can be from grassroots definitely thank you very much a uh, question from lewis story just to all of you guys would you recommend um sending in action for the young categories or supposed to be relevant for any portfolio category or do you try for more creative technique shots <clears throat> that's to any of you guys um i i think you need a you need, you need a balance you, you need a mix you know um a, a, you know, a good solid action picture, something that has good lines, good graphics, is, is you know, a standout picture, is part of a set. You know, if, if you pick five very artistic pictures, then maybe you're missing uh, you know, what is essentially a, a key ingredient of sports photography, which is that, you know, that high action moment. You know, it's a balance. So, yeah, I mean, if you've got a great frame, then it definitely it should be part of a set. No, I agree with that. You, you definitely need one stonking action picture, don't you, Rich? Definitely. And then a, a feature picture, as Paul said, get out there, get a grassroots. You don't don't have to have professional sport. Definitely. I say um, just on that. If you do put an action picture in there, which is you know, like I've said, it is good to do. Um, you want to make sure it's a good one because there's going to be a lot of people putting in a slide tackle or a rugby tackle or whatever and the judges will want to make sure that your stands out from there so if, you, if you're not sure about it or whatever you know ask for someone's advice but if it's going to be an action picture it's got going to have to be a good action picture what would you guys uh, suggest uh, or would you guys suggest against submitting black and white pictures um this is from george wood he just says he hasn't seen many uh, in uh, many black and white pictures in awards portfolios before um as 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 a panel judge before um i'll take this one so um I think the thing with a black and white picture is more often than not you've got to ask yourself why it's in there um and for it to be in a in a portfolio it needs to be there for all the right reasons rather than because it's a picture that doesn't necessarily quite work in color and you think if i turn it to black and white it looks it looks better or you think that it adds a little bit of variety in terms of technique and style you know that that doesn't work at all to be honest you know entering a black and white picture it needs to have been thought out as a black and white picture. Um, and more often than not, you know, the, the, the judging panel are a pretty, pretty talented bunch, you know, with, with a lot of experience in the industry and they can see through it. So most of the time I would advise against a black and white picture unless, unless, you know, it, it from start to finish, it was thought out in that way. Um, and it adds something to the set of pictures, but if it doesn't, and you're just doing it for the sake of it, do not do, stay well clear. I made that stupid mistake. I uh, had nine pictures and I converted an Anthony Joshua to black and white. And someone said to me after, you absolutely ruined that portfolio. You should have gone black and white or color all the way through, not nine and one. 
So it just doesn't, it just doesn't work. You know, you have to remember that set of 10 or set of five, yeah. you know, yes, they're, yeah. they're, they're a mixture of creative and action and feature and everything mm -hmm. else, but it has to work as a set as well. And, you know, yeah. more often than not, if you put one black and white picture in there, it just, it sets everything it. off balance. You just, you just it, it's, it's difficult to understand the thought process behind why a photographer has changed something to black and white, unless, yeah. unless of course, it's evident that they've started out in that, in that fashion. But then if you've got a great black and white set of five pictures, have the guts and go for it. Look at, look yeah. at Lawrence Lustig did with that black and white set. It was incredible boxing set in black and white, wasn't it? Yeah, I've, 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 yeah, I have seen complete sets of black and white imagery in, included yeah. in short lists. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, but, but having one in a set of ten or or five, it just doesn't really work. No, don't do it. Interesting. You talk about sort of full sets, and I think you've alluded to this, uh, Richard, already. Is how important do you guys think that the all the overall order or a flow of a set is? And just one point from me on the logistics side of things. So the order you enter, you'll see it on the entry system and the order you enter your pictures in is the order of what goes in front of the, of the judges. But just from you guys, how important is that and how much time do you spend moving it, uh, moving, moving the order around and, uh, and making sure everything's just right? I think it does. It's, it's it is important. Um, you know, like sort of Dickie said, you know, starting it with a, a very strong, impactful picture that makes the rest of the judges think, oh, okay, yeah, this is something to look at. I'm gonna pay I'm gonna pay interest in this set. But I think you 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 need to find a flow where things um you know, if you have two pictures that are very similar, so say if you have two pictures that are very high contrast, very very monotone in their appearance so sort of you know like Alex's sort of tennis silhouette where if you had say say Alex's, t Alex's tennis silhouette next to say my um, football action with the black background you wouldn't put those two pictures side by side because they're very similar in their photographic style so you've got to, you've got to have a flow and personally I always think the last picture in the set should be the one that make should be the funny should be the one that make people think you know puts a smile on their face puts makes a little chuckle makes a laugh because that 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 last feeling when you've looked at a set of pictures is the judges aren't thinking like oh okay yeah they're thinking oh <laughs> yeah a little bit of a, a humor to it you know potentially you know makes them maybe look at the set of pictures in you know slightly more positive yeah you know, slightly different light Maybe one for Paul on that though. How do the, the judges actually look at the set of pictures? Does it come up first one by one and then you look at it as a set, as like a, a contact sheet after or? Uh, we, do, we, do, we do look at them as a set. I, I would absolutely say that, you know, personally, I, be, I do believe that any, any portfolio is a set of pictures um, and that, you know, more often than not, I look, you know, Personally, the sets that I used to build as a photographer, you know, it almost had a, a start as everybody's talked about here with a big bang and it finishes with a big bang and somewhere in the middle, there's a big bang as well, you know, so that when you're looking through, that's, that's, that's the flow. But, uh, you know, you also look at the juxtaposition of imagery and you look at, you look at the, the format and, and, you know, more often than not, you know, if the, fir if the first picture in a contact sheet is, is looking to the, is, is pointing out the frame to the left, and everything else on the flow is going to the right. It doesn't work. You know, you've got to, you've got to think about how they work next to each other. Um, and and I think there's a real there's a real art to it. And it, you know, you take pride in your work when you're out at an event. So you take pride in assembling your portfolio the best that you possibly can. Um, but yeah, you, we we in as in the judging process, you see them as a contact sheet. You so you see them as a group and how they work together. Um, and then you look at them individually as well as as you know. A, on the, pull on the screen. That's interesting what you said there, Paul, then. I didn't know that. Rights, lefts and centres. That's really interesting what, what the judges are looking for. I would have known that. That's good. Uh, I, I, I don't know if every judge is looking for it. I'm just, to, you know, my own... Yeah, but you're a good picture man. You're a good picture man. Yeah, you know, for me, it, it's a flow from start to finish, you know, from top left to bottom right. It's a flow. Yeah. Okay. I remember that. Just another question that. for you guys on sort of building your portfolios. Uh, and do, I mean, do you, do you recommend every picture be a different sport? I obviously know that the young sports photographer of the year category is only five pictures, whereas some of the other portfolios are, are 10. Uh, but do you look to 
to, to really really mix it up as much as possible or mm. and how do you manage that if you've got a, maybe two or three really strong uh, pitches from one specific sport do you then go through them and, and decide to drop one do you, do you try and push the boundaries and, and keep them in how have you guys worked that out in the past i'd say for the five that it's it's very different um <clears throat> because you really don't want to miss a belter if you've got it in a different you know if you've got three football pictures as long as you've got a little bit of variety but don't leave a picture out that's one of your favorite pictures just because it's a similar sport to you've already got um definitely definitely keep a variety mm -hmm. but um don't don't miss anything out if you think it's worth putting in the only the only, the only thing I'll, I'll add is that last last year um we did see a couple of entrants actually that entered one sport and their portfolios were fantastic it was five pictures one sport but because it was one sport, they were disqualified. So, you know, it, the wow. expectation wow. is there that it is, you know, it says it in the rules. It's from a, it's from a variety of sports. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think that's the key for, for me sitting on the judging uh, for, the, for, for the last couple of years. That's definitely a real key word that goes around, uh, goes around amongst the judges is, is variety, obviously not just variety in sports, but sort of styles of pictures as well. Um, somebody's asked, would you advise on putting a posed portrait in your set of five, uh, or should it be more five, five candid photos? I shall pull that. Um, I, it, it, absolutely. A portrait can be in a set of five. Of course it can, you know, if it's sport related, if, uh, absolutely. I mean, look, if you look at Alex's set that won last year, there, there's a picture, there's a portrait of Pep Guardiola in there, you know, so, so why not? Yeah, absolutely. As, as long as you've got the variety across the other four in terms of techniques, styles and uh, et cetera, then yeah, I would, I would say there's, there's no harm in having a portrait in there. Um, if you've got, you know, it, it, yeah, totally. I, I wouldn't have an issue with that at all. Just don't turn it to black and white. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, moving on to some more questions just around sort of generally uh, general the, the, the industry uh, a couple of people have asked similar questions on what advice do you give uh, would you give in terms of getting yourself and your work in front of the right people uh, agencies um, and just building relationships yeah. with, with people um you've got to you've got to be persistent but you've also got to be kind of like if you don't hear back, you're not going to hear back. Fine. Okay. Don't worry about it. You've just got to um, put it in front of several different people. You know, a lot of, a lot of us are very accessible, you know, um, through social media, etc. cetera. Um, it, it, you know, we, we're always going to be giving feedback and, you know, if we, you know, even as photographers, if, you know, if I see someone, you know, here's an extremely good example i know of someone who was, or i thought has got potential i mentioned them to paul and now they're a star photographer at, at, you know, here you know, at getty shooting shooting sport now that's you know that came through various other circumstances as well and it wasn't straightforward and you know and alex is the same you know you know, you know alex you know came by Michael Regan so you know it, it's it's not necessarily thinking oh I must get my stuff in front of Paul I must stuff get my stuff in front of picture editors you know there are other ways um I, I think what you have to do is just um you know yeah, we're all quite busy but we're always also very open and very you know you've probably got more chance of getting uh, feedback from some of the photographers and you have say someone who is extremely busy as a DOP, um, you know, but just be persistent, you know, don't be downhearted when you don't hear back, you know, I mean, I know, I see some of the names on this call, I know there's a, you know, there's a few in there that have, you know, that have managed to get a foothold and, you know, and, you know, some of them have come in by knowing other photographers, you know, some of them have come in by just being very persistent, so it's, you know, just don't give up on things, just, you know, be very, very, yeah. Yeah, open to different yeah. ways. Sorry, Gompo. No, no, I was, yeah, look, you know, before I moved to London, when I was at Bristol City, you know, I was, I was sending a CD of my work to various picture editors every month, you know, and I was, I was sending them emails every couple of weeks, you know, it's like persistence and hunger is a, is a huge part of it, 
you know, and, and it's like, you know, like Richard says, you know, everybody's accessible now through social media far more than they were, were back then. Um, but, you know, so, so getting your name recognized um, through persistence is a good thing. It, it really is. No one's going to, no one's going to tell you to go away. You know, it's, but they might not answer your email every time um, or your texts or your calls, but, but you're seeing your name, you know, it, it, it pays off, you know, um, so, so be persistent and, and continue to pester us, you know, not just me, but everybody across the industry. Um, but, but, you know, build relationships because there's some great people in this industry that all want to help you. Um, you know, they're not, not just Getty photographers or, or Fleet Street photographers, you know, across all different agencies, you know, there's some great mm -hmm. people and they, they've all got advice to give. So, you know, reach out to them. Um, but think about what makes your pictures stand out. You know, you've got you've got to understand light. You've got to you've got to look at your backgrounds. You've got to try and fill the frame. You know, it's not just about telling the story with a with a celebration. You know, it's it, use the use the gear that you've got to the best of its capability. Um, you know, if if you haven't got a four hundred mil, so what? It doesn't matter. You know, but we use what you have got and try and fill the frame as much as possible with it. You know, it, 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 these are all the things that we've done all the things that all of us have done um, and we've persisted with it. And I think if you, if you persist, if you persist, there is, there's a lot of people that will listen to you. Got, uh, got a question here from uh, Kieran Riley saying, how do you guys tackle sports photography during the, uh, the winter months when you were at the beginning of your career? <clears throat> by, by a decent pair of uh, wet trousers. <laughs> and lots of towels, if that's what you mean, against the elements, etc., etc. But cameras these days are, you know, the ASAs, 4,000 ASA on cannons, etc., etc. You know, it's no problem at all. I'd rather sit in the rain at uh, a football match or sit in the rain at rugby any day of the week. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Richard, what do you think? Yeah, just, you know, one of the things I always say is like, is, is sometimes it sounds a bit corny, is like, you know, make sure like you're, you're prepared for situations you know like the, yeah. the last thing you want to do is rush out of the house at the last minute get to a ground go to get your waterproofs out your bag and they're sitting in your house take five minutes before you leave i, I still do this now after 20 years to take five minutes just to think have i got this i've got that yeah i've got that i've got that have i got a spare chamois yeah i've got that you know if it's pouring down with rain right it's, it's, you know, I see this a lot. There's no harm. You know, if you can't afford like, you know, like a, a 60 a cent towel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. You know, use a towel, use a chamois, use a bin liner. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, it keeps your gear protected. And, you know, it, it's, it's about like, it's just making sure you've got what you need. And, and, you know, and you don't have to have like, you know, you know like Paul said, if you haven't got 400, so, so what? Use what you've got. It's the same principle. Just, you know, use what you've got, be sensible, and just take that time just to be prepared, regardless whether it's summer, winter, whatever. I think it's so easy to sit there and uh, feel sorry for yourself as well. Um, but nine times out of ten, when it's raining, the pictures can be better, you know, so you've got yeah. to just take advantage of the situation you're in. Um, I'm sure he won't mind me saying, but Alex Davidson that's on the call was a really miserable match at the start of this year and went and got an absolute belter of a sliding tackle with mud everywhere and everything. And it, it, it was brilliant. So, you know, sometimes it's so easy to sit there and, and get wound up, but you know, if you make the most of it, you can get, get some great stuff in the rain. As, as Richard said, be prepared, make sure you've got towels, make sure you've got your waterproofs. There's no point sitting in the pouring rain and you are getting absolutely drenched. Me and Richie have seen it from experienced photographers. Oh, I forgot my waterproofs. I haven't got a towel and they're just absolutely destroying their cameras. I've seen it so many times. Yeah. Always remember your kit. Thanks very yeah. much, guys. <laughs> so one last, one last question. Somebody's asked, what would you say is the best way to, uh, to approach other photographers for their advice and critiques? Obviously, that's been something that's come up, especially to ask ab about, obviously, general work, but sort of specifically about <laughs> awards portfolios. This person said the feedback, obviously, is really important, but sometimes bigging yourself up can feel a little bit uncomfortable. What would you would say the best way to do it was? Just be open to constructive criticism, constructive yeah, yeah. criticism. We're not, you know, you know, 
people just you know we generally want to help you know um so yeah yeah we are all busy as well but we will you know most people will take the time to respond and you know and and be helpful where we can and you know yeah, sometimes the responses might be a bit short or you know sort of not maybe not as full um explained as you would expect because you know we're, we're, i'm rushing off here or i'm here or i'm busy doing this um you know, you know someone like paul is phenomenally busy um on a level that most of us as photographers don't even understand um so you know it, it's you, you're going to get you know different responses from different people but everyone's just trying to be helpful and you know take everything on board and just and and, and i think it'd be fine well, thanks, guys. Just wanted to say, uh, obviously, heading towards the end of the web webinar now, and but a massive thank you for you uh, for you all giving up your your, your, your time today. Um, if anybody's got any other questions, there may be some that I've missed. Obviously, feel free to send me an email. I'll send you all an email after this, so you've got my details, and we'll uh, we'll make sure we get an answer to you. Uh, before we go, um, just a, there's just something that I did a couple of weeks ago. So I went to a few of the previous judges just to say what if they could give one piece of advice what would it be um, and just got a few back uh, it says one here says main tips to think of uh, it as uh, think of it as a portfolio not just a collection of your best picks try to lay the picks out either as prints or on screen and make sure they all hang together and obviously this is exactly what these guys have said here today um pretty much the same thing here just take your take your time over it show a variety of skills and tech techniques uh this person here sort of recommends start starting work weeks before um which almost i suppose we're almost getting to that stage now uh and again just hanging pictures together seem to, and putting everything together to form a, a portfolio seems to be one of the main features about what's been covered today um and the, the lastly somebody said look for moments show us something yeah, new thanks. work the angles uh and favorite pictures of something that only happened once so there it is sort of directly uh from the judges um and like i say just want to say thanks again to these guys uh thanks very much to jackie and cannon for putting all of this together and last but not least just gonna have a little rummage around to pick the winner like I say, very glamorous draw we've got here. And the winner I've got is Molly Darlington. So Molly, I'll get in touch after the call and we'll get you Richard's book in the post. Uh, thank you very much. Like I say, if anybody has, uh, if anybody needs anything, good luck in Into the Awards. Any questions, then feel free to get in touch. Cheers, guys. Brilliant. Yes, thanks very much. Thank you.